question that a lot of people have, which is about uh, how to deter rape. And generally, the popular assumption, the common assumption is that if you have a harsh sentence, then that will deter rape. Uh, I think that, see, to some extent, some part of this is uh, a sense of uh, uh, anger at the fact that there's so much impunity for rape. So people also feel, start feeling that whatever is the harshest punishment, give it. That is uh, something that is at the level of emotion and sentiment, and let's get, keep that aside. I think if you talk about the substantive issue, I think first we need to understand what is rape and why that happens in order to deter it. And if we see that rape is happening not because some people become evil and do it, but because our society has a sense of, it, it confers a sense of entitlement on men, entitlement to a lot of things. Men feel entitled to have wives who will provide certain kinds of services. Men feel entitled to be able to control uh, what women in their families will do and from there it's a short leap to men feeling entitled to sex from women and I think that this is crucial and if we don't strike at the heart of this entitlement then we can't deter rape that is to begin with the understanding. Now the problem is that the death penalty is problematic for rape in many ways, more ways than one. One is of course the fact that uh, in countries which have had the death penalty there has been no substantial really deterring of rape and really playing around with numbers and statistics in this doesn't really help because the point is that there is not enough evidence to show that uh, killing people for raping people stops people from raping people, it doesn't. The other thing is that of course where you have a death, uh, death penalty for say uh, rape and the same death penalty for murder then of course there's also the chance that uh, you know people will, uh, the person who has raped will feel, let me wipe out the evidence. But that is a smaller part of my, my arguments uh, or in this case. My main argument rests on the work that women's groups have done with rape survivors. And I think that this is a position I should say that a lot of women's groups have not had. Even our, my own organization has at one point of time uh, supported the question of death penalty for rape but has changed, we have changed our minds. I think one of the reasons for changing our minds is the fact that uh, we see that a whole lot of uh, women uh, victims, uh, the, perpetrators is act the perpetrators are actually not a stranger, it's not a faceless stranger, it is someone very well known and trusted, usually in the family or in the neighborhood or a teacher or a guru or somebody like that, someone really, really well known and trusted. So part of the trouble that the survivor has in naming this perpetrator is uh, not only the fact that this person is trusted and people, you know, uh, partly the fact that uh, people are likely to say, well, don't talk about him like that, just shut up, you must be lying, but also the fact that she herself feels that she has felt some attachment for this person and she feels conflicted, she's not sure whether she would, uh, you know, she's very upset and very angry, she's not sure whether she would like to see him in jail, she's, she's, she has to think about it. So this is something which the complainant goes through, a long process of what, are the, what is going to be the impact on her other relationships by actually making a complaint against a person like this. Because it's a web of social relationships there. Now if you have a death penalty there, if it is even worse than, even more than actually sending a someone to jail, which is a big step, then I think that it is really going to end up being a deterrent for the complainant rather than for a deterrent for the uh, perpetrator. Then of course you have the fact that you have actually had death sentences, you have had Dhananjay Chatterjee killed, you have had a whole uh, crowd of women in Nagpur actually killing a rapist, uh, somebody who was per, uh, uh, persecuting them, killing him in public in a courtroom, uh, 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 you know, bashing his brains against the wall. None of this has really deterred rapes, in, even in the near vicinity there or any other place. So this should be enough for us to understand that. Now I think that, as I said before, now what is the deterrent? What is the deterrent? I think that then, I think the, uh, the kind of um, two, two things I'll say. One is of course the fact that then this, the sense of entitlement that I said, how to chip away at that. One is of course the fact that then, uh, you know, uh, uh, conferring equality, trying for equality at all levels, not just in terms of, uh, you know, uh, rape alone, but a larger way. And therefore also fighting the ideas that support this sense of entitlement the ideas that blame women for sexual violence, which are so widespread. So in my mind, the number one deterrent for rape would be if 
uh, as a society, we were able to stop blaming victims for rape, stop telling women how they should behave differently in order not to be raped, which is something we, have, we do very commonly, society does it, uh, powerful institutions do it, including even in recent times in a very large number, these are not aberrations, policemen, judges, uh, politicians, you name it, even institutions like that, let alone godmen and common people in society. So I think that that needs to change. And the last thing I'll say is that um, we need to ask ourselves, what are we really doing for the survivors of sexual violence? And I think that we're doing very little as a state, as a society, very little indeed. There's very little support that survivors have to fall back upon. And the reason for that is that there are only certain cases that generate outrage. Only certain cases where the woman's body has been so badly damaged and so on and so forth, that it, that, uh, uh, and even not all of those cases, but some selected cases which generate a whole lot of outrage. But the point is that uh, on those cases possibly you may get a death sentence in the courts. The courts will hand out a death sentence because the public is demanding it and they'll say the conscience of the people demands it or whatever it is. The thing is that that doesn't help because the real battle lies in those everyday cases in which people start blaming victims, in which people start thinking, no, this isn't quite rape, or maybe rape didn't happen. So actually the real battle that we're battling, we're struggling out there, isn't helped by these certain instances, because these certain instances help to promote the idea that all is well. It serves to reassure the state and reassure patriarchy that they are man enough to avenge rape. And that doesn't help us. We don't need anybody to be man enough to do anything. We need to be able to unpack uh, privilege, unpack masculine entitlement and actually generate a sense of uh, equality and freedom for women. That's the way. Uh, the fact is that um, uh, I think that the, more, the, you know, the, the death slogan of death penalty was not the most important slogan being raised there. Uh, because the, uh, I say this in terms of historic importance, okay, there were a lot of people raising it, yes, but uh, it's not, it's been raised for years and years in India for, you know, when people feel outraged about murders, about rapes and so on. It's a sense of outpouring of public anger, it's not very new or very notable. What was notable, however, was the fact that uh, in my memory and in the memory of uh, feminists that I know, women's movement activists that I know, for the first time, a significant number of people uh, on the streets who had no exposure to the women's movement or to the Muslim movement or whatever, were actually raising slogans against victim blaming. So they were not talking about that one terrible, horrible case, but they were talking in general about how we blame women for rape and how we treat women in everyday life. So two examples I'll give you there. One was that you had a lot of slogans about saying, don't teach women how to dress, teach men how to behave. Okay. And the other most important slogan was the slogan of women's freedom, uh, saying that women want freedom and if they talked about freedom then not just the freedom to be free on the streets, to be freedom free from fear of rape on the streets, but very soon it began to talk about freedom inside homes, okay, freedom in, and not just from sexual violence, but the freedom over their own lives, freedom to marry who they like and so on. And clearly that these protesters were seeing these linkages. They were seeing that the taking away of their freedoms uh, in the name of protecting them was something that uh, they saw as being dangerous to them. They could, uh, you know, they could sense of they were feeling uncomfortable with this idea of, oh, let's protect you. And I think that that's where the whole question of the death penalty from the state comes in. The women's groups opposed it because for historic reasons, women's groups have arrived at this position, as I said. And so they unitedly put out a statement explaining why they were not in favor of the death penalty. And uh, Justice Verma Committee, in fact, put this on record in their uh, report that we might have been tempted to recommend the death penalty had it not been for the fact that uh, unanimously women's groups said that they were not in favor of the death penalty for rape and for the reasons I've already talked about. Um, now, I think that the, uh, when you come to this whole idea about you know, offering protection to women uh, in exchange for, certain, for taking away certain freedoms, essentially, you know, support for taking away freedoms, so this was big in the streets. People were really, really talking about this and were angry and upset about the fact that, you know, uh, this about the talk of masculine protection. And I think that the question of death penalty comes with that package. Let me give you another example. There were some, you know, among the death, uh, the death penalty sloganeers on the streets that I remember seeing one, I have a photograph in fact of one of the play cards being held up by a young girl actually, saying that, uh, 
सांसद अपनी चूड़ियाँ तोड़ो और बलात्कारियों को हमारे ऊपर छोड़ो और समथिंग लाइक दैट यू नो बेसिकली सेम दी एम पीज हैव बैंगल्स ऑन द हैंड्स एंड दे एफ एम एन एट देर अनेबल टू डील वेल विद रेपिस जस्ट लेट रेपिस यूज एंड डज डील विद नाउ द थिंग इज वॉट इज द सेम ए इट इज एक्चुअली इन सैंटिंग वीमेन इट्स एक्चुअली सेम दैट टू बी अ फेमिनाइन टू बी अ वुमन इज समथिंग टू बी वीक टू बी लेस दैन मैन एंड सो ऑन and it's also saying that we expect the the state we expect to be you know uh, to be manly and protect women and this is exactly what women were raising many women as i said there were multiple you know voices in this multiple impulses in this movement many many young women were raising slogans against this idea of masculine protection because they knew that it comes with when somebody says i'll be your brother and protect you he'll also be the same person who will say oh who's that person you're dating i don't like him you can't date him and so on and so forth so clearly they saw through that and they were raising slogans against this and so this business about we'll be manly and protect you if you ma- if the state is manly enough then we can hang rape this is something that the indian state need, feels the need to tell it the indian and i'm sure other states feel the need to tell themselves patriarchy feels the need to hang a few rapists now and then to assure that you know, we know how to deal with rapists and women who have uh, uh, people who take away our women's honor so i think that this is something which is uh, deeply problematic and uh, it's something which goes against the very spirit of what was most uh, important and most path breaking in last year's movement now finally uh, the question about what happens uh, you know when the state is able to raise this law i think that the in the clamor for death penalty uh, you get to actually suppress a whole lot of substantial issues okay so uh, you know, what is it you look at every judgment which i have in recent time seen which the uh, judgment on death penalty and essentially what are they saying the shakti mills judgment for instance the arguments being made there by the prosecution are all about how the loss of chastity and the loss of honor are equivalent to the loss of a woman's life this is like the comment by a woman politician in parliament last year which says that a raped woman is a zinda lash she is a walking corpse and remember how angry people were against those statements last year they were upset by against this so i think that um, you know so uh, uh, what what is happening is that the same mps and you will see this a pattern where very often the same leaders were waiting for the death penalty in certain cases so uh, they, they will also be saying at the same time that women should not be crossing lakshman rekha's women should not be dressing in a certain way and so on and uh, they will be completely silent on uh atrocious remarks blaming uh, you know women's clothes for rape and so on and so forth they won't speak out against that they will uh, they won't speak out against instances of moral policing or even against honor killings or cup panchayats and so on so i think that uh, what is it what is it saying then essentially they are uh, less angry they are angry in certain kinds of rapes where they are able to think that the person the perpetrator is somebody you are able to profile the community of the perpetrator you are able to say oh slum dwellers or you are able to say oh muslims or you are able to say oh whatever some 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 kind of somebody out there the problem is outside us the problem lies outside there the death penalty and the cry for it helps to do that it helps to say exteriorize it and say there's a demon out there killing him will solve the problem killing them will solve the problem so this not only helps to suppress other substantial issues for women which is you can only address the problem of sexual violence if you say no the problem does not lie out there the problem lies in here it lies in, within all of us it lies in our society in the society we build and how do we rebuild it unpack it and rebuild it again uh, it does that and it also serves as again i lend by saying that it has also in dangerous ways served to uh, offer a pretext you know uh, allow women to be used as a convenient slogan to say save our mothers and daughters by killing some men of certain communities so profiling certain communities of men as dangerous you know i recently just this morning i read in the newspapers about a rape in muzaffarnagar where uh, i looked you know the you know uh, clearly you know the perpetrators and the victim are from the same community there wasn't a communal angle there and uh, it's a it's a it's a horrendous rape where the rape was videographed and so on and so forth uh, the thing is that in that same muzaffarnagar so clearly the problem was not to do with one particular community it was not to do with the minority community and yet there were leaders who made speeches there saying save our mothers and daughters from the community that rapes our mothers and daughters and uh, none of that solved the problem of rape did it but it did serve as an excuse to unleash violence on that community 
um, in the name of giving blood, you know, giving rapists what they deserve. And inevitably, the groups that did this were in fact the same car panchayats which take away women's freedoms. I know that this may not directly link in with your, you know, with the question, but to in my mind, it's actually very closely linked with the question of the death penalty, because the death penalty also operates on the same paradigm of saying that the problem is out there and we will avenge you by, you know, we will avenge the raped woman by meeting out a terrible thing, a terrible act of violence to, uh, you know, the perpetrator or the accused or the perceived perpetrator. And I don't think that helps. See, one question which always troubles me uh, is that, for one thing, yes, the act of rape is truly uh, inhumane and brutal. And here I'll say that that's not just the rapes in which the inhumanity and brutality is in your face because somebody's intestines are spilled on the floor. But because every rape is inhumane, uh, I, won't use, I won't even use the word inhumane because uh, largely humans are among the only species that actually do have rape. You know, it's, it's arguable, but I think so. And uh, so, so I won't even use the word inhuman. I will say that in fact this is something to do with human society and what's wrong with it. And it's truly, truly uh, uh, a horrific, terrific thing. Any instance of sexual violence, any instance of uh, uh, sexual violence is actually a very ugly display of power, of entitlement, of humiliation. To use an analogy, I'll say that, you know, if you think about what a caste atrocity means, I think of rapes and so on as essentially as a gender atrocity, as a reminder that, you know, of women, of their subjection and their humiliation. And sometimes, of course, these, uh, the gender and the caste atrocities overlap and you have, you know, women being singled out from certain castes in order to humiliate, you know, them for being from that caste and so on. So I think that in such situations, uh, uh, really, the question of uh, um, uh, you know the what is going to be the punishment? Then? Surely the punishment has to be something uh, you know uh, to argue that the punishment in itself should be uh, brutal and humiliating uh, defeats the purpose. In my mind, if you have a Keralanji where an entire village watches when you know, some people and, and, and gleefully celebrates when a woman and her family are raped and hacked to death, uh, the way that disturbs us, surely it should disturb us if uh, you're going to, as a country, as a nation, going to stand and gleefully uh, watch when a man, uh, however guilty he may be of a terrible crime, is going to be um, you know, uh, killed in cold blood. Uh, so there is a you know, the sense of uh, uh, I'm not reflecting on uh, the implications of the action, number one. Secondly, about, uh, I'll come to the question of reform a little later. The other question that bothers me is that, uh, you know, how is it that, uh, you know, who are the, in which case are the perpetrators more likely to be punished? Okay. Now, if you have a Delhi gang rape or a Shakti Mills gang rape, or whatever it is, then you have in the death penalty, you have it in the Hanumar Chatterjee. Now, uh, was the rape at, uh, Kerlanji any less horrendous? Was the rape of Tanjan Manorama in Manipur by the Assam Rifles Javans any less horrendous? Uh, you know, she was not only raped and, uh, and that she was killed with bullets in her private parts. So that to, to do away with the evidence of the rape, exactly, I mean, in my mind it's a parallel with what happened on the streets of Delhi. Now the problem is that, uh, you know, you can't, uh, nobody, let alone hang, no one will touch powerful institutions. In the Kerlanji case, the courts did give a life imprisonment uh, sentence, but they did not uh, and they did uh, they did not give any justice to the question of rape, as in they did not acknowledge that a rape had occurred. There was no acknowledgement. Our we have we are yet our judiciary, our justice system is yet to admit that in Kerlanji rapes occurred there. It's yet to do that. Okay. And it's yet to admit that that was a caste atrocity. These are two things that we are yet to admit as a, as a justice system. In the Manorama case, we haven't yet been able to bring those army jawans, the accused, to trial. So how is it that in some cases we will not even be able to bring someone to trial? And in other cases, the entire nation will say in one voice, yes, death penalty, and the courts will say, well, the nation wants it, so we hand out death penalty. I don't think that this is a right way for courts in any democratic country to behave. 
to be moved by uh, you know the vagaries of uh, you know uh, the uh, the biases that uh, uh, that calibrate how much outrage is generated and how in which case. Okay. Uh, the other question is the question of reform. I think that uh, you know exactly if you think of this as a social problem, it is easier to I will say it is easier to kill people. It's easier even to lock them up away. Uh, than to actually take on the challenge of changing a society that goes on generating rape. And if we want to stop being a society that goes on generating rape, then we will have to think about the question of reform in a very, very serious way. We have to confront what it is that is preventing reform, what it is that is allowing people to think, even though they are seeing these movements against rape and so on, but to keep thinking in the ways which allow them to rape the next day. All right, which is allowing even participants in a protest against rape to actually maybe molest a woman some other time. And I'm not saying this in, ju in judgmental way about any set of people. I'm saying that we can't be self-righteous about this. It could be any of us. It could be uh, a, a people um, with the otherwise the best of credentials and intentions. But somewhere where it comes to gender, then uh, this, this sense of entitlement and sense of power that is uh, there in our society is very, very powerful, is more powerful than other impulses. How do we change that? And there I think that the question is then not just the question of reform of individual rapists, but the whole question of, and or the, in, the question of the reformative potential of our, you know, juvenile justice systems and our jails and so on, but the potential of reform of our society. And I think that these have to be linked and these are very crucial questions. The other question is, of course, the question about, you know, which we often get asked is that, you know, feminists, you're feminists and you don't stand for uh, death penalty for rape, you know, you're soft on rapists, which, uh, you know, uh, people on, uh, you know, the nation often wants to know that sometimes. So, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, they, they throw the, you know, they put us in the dock. Last year it happened, you know, a prime time channel uh, on, during the December movement in which we were the participants. You find people who are not participants in the movement, men, actually being encouraged to, you know, sit and point fingers at the women's groups and say, oh, women's groups are soft and they don't, they want a soft state and so on. Now, I think that we need to change the criteria completely for what it is which, uh, which judges whether you're serious about sexual violence or not, okay? And there it has to be, what is your, your attitude towards the complaint, okay? What is your attitude towards uh, victim blaming? What is your attitude towards institutions and institutions which are given impunity? So the same uh, people who may be so self-righteous about uh, the December gang rape and say that, oh, you know, all of them are absolute evil and they should be, you know, you're so sure about that. And yet you're completely silent on institutions that as institutions protect rape accused in an equally terrible case, for instance, the Indian Army. The Manorama case is one case, but there are several others. There's a Punan Koshpura case where an entire village of women in Kashmir was raped. And uh, recently, even the district magistrate, it's a rape that happened more than 20 years ago, and the district magistrate has said now on record that he believes the rapes did happen and they've been covered up. So what about the institutions that have protected them? Where is the, indigna where is the indignation and outrage for that? So I think that these women's groups have taken up these cases. They have not been moved by uh, the character of, you know, the, the, the background of the perpetrator or the background of the, um, or the, of the um, survivor of the victim or the victim or by uh, which institution the perpetrator is linked with. That has not blinded the women's movement. That has not changed the way the women's movement looks at an instance of rape. And yet it seems to change the way in which, uh, you know, the media looks at rape, in which the, uh, you know, so many people look at rape. So I think that that needs to change. And for that, this uh, kind of unthinking clamor for the death penalty uh, really has to go away. In, there is this, as I said, in last year when we were in the movement, this was a question for us. And I, I, I we had a very good experience, actually. See, when we first went to India, uh, we could hear nothing there but the death penalty. That was the only slogan in a way that, uh, you know, uh, the only loud slogan that you could hear. And yet there were play cards there, as I said, with other slogans, okay, with other wonderful things being written against victim blaming and so on. So clearly people had those things on their minds. But in terms of a slogan, this is, this is the only thing that you think of. So we, we wanted to change, and to women, and you know, to their rights. So we tried to, what we tried to do there was that we, we saw you know, young women raising slogans of women's freedom. And we just tried to give, bring those slogans a little bit to center stage. 
So we found that when as a small group of women, we, we began raising slogans about women want freedom, women want freedom on the streets, freedom to go to school, freedom to go to college, freedom in the metro, and then you know freedom in the house. We found huge response. Suddenly, you were finding that there were you know hundreds of people joining in these slogans and women responding back from below powerfully with. Uh, we, we would say khab se azadi and women were responding back saying bhab se bhi azadi, bhai se bhi azadi and clearly they were, you know, they were then talking about the things that restrict their freedom, their everyday freedom and uh, this tremendous anger against being told what to know, you know uh, do's and don'ts for how to avoid rape which you know Delhi police actually puts up, there's a tremendous anger against that. So we found that uh, there was, we could really raise, the, make this slogan come to the forefront to a very large extent. And then we would start a conversation about all of this about the death penalty and we found that nowhere where we you know angrily confronted or anything like that people actually change their minds uh, yes there are people who would like to mobilize lynch mobs but let's not confuse that issue with people who genuinely feel angry about rape feeling angry about rape is good but uh, what we need to do is engage uh, with the experience of rape survivors to say that anger about rape need not mean you know and should not mean a plan of rape.